come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, especially for 200 years of this parish church of St. Mary's Kilmood, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray in the power of his spirit that we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Before the bells, God's praise is rang and called the faithful where other faithful sleep who built this holy barn. This bigger barn and garnered what God himself has given. This more than a place of dressed stone charm. This is the house of God and gate of heaven. This is the place of pilgrim's prayer of journeyings begun with joy and often with shared sorrows ended, a place for each, both blessed and shriven, this within the embrace and parish reach, this is the house of God and gate of heaven. This is the place where God is met, where at his table gathered round, in joy and sorrow, God is here and speaks to each of love profound of sins forgiving and sin forgiven. This beacon upon a hillside set, this is the house of God and the gate of heaven. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in thought, word, and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own fault. By what we have done and by what we have failed to do, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all of our past, and grant that we may serve you in the newness of life, the glory of your name. Amen. The mighty God, who forgives all who truly repent and mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips. Amen. And our mouth will proclaim your praise. God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. And he dreamed, 
And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land in which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. The place, Bethel, and the name of the city was Lutz at the first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat, and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. that I say to you be in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So if I could thank uh, the rector for his very kind invitation to preach here today at what I know is an important event in the life of the continuing pilgrimage of this parish. And just to get the formalities over to also thank the Bishop of Down for allowing me to trespass in his diocese today. Um, There have been a good many 200th anniversaries this year. I've preached at, I think, about 20. Um, Because the 1820s uh, were the days of what became known as the Second Reformation in Ireland. And it was a time of enormous energy within the Church of Ireland. Although not always, I have to say, to our credit. But nevertheless, there was a great deal of zeal uh, around in the 1820s. However, it's, it's the first of these anniversaries that I've preached at east of the Ban. Uh, and the history and the feel of places east of the Ban are very different, including churches, than they are in the west. Uh, as you will probably know, uh, the counties of Antrim and Down were not part of the official government scheme of plantation at the beginning of the 17th century. They were private enterprises, uh, and they developed their own personality. Whereas Ulster, west of the Ban, became a world of small, regular estates, uh, 
the east of the province, including County Down, was characterised by the massive estates of James Hamilton, Arthur Chichester, Randall MacDonald, and, of course, Hugh Montgomery, from whom the Gordons acquired Florida Manor and carved out uh, that estate. West of the ban, landlord leasing policies, the relationship between landlord and tenant, were prescribed and controlled by what were known as the orders and conditions of the plantation scheme, whereas in County Down uh, estates and the parishes that were built on them were shaped by different forces, by much closer negotiations between landlord and tenant. So in short, as the historians have called it, it wasn't a plantation world, it was a colonial world. And that had an influence on the churches that were built and the way they were built and the way they were, they were, the way they were financed. Essentially, there were uh, three ways to finance the building of a church like this. And this is, by Church of Ireland standards of the 19th century, a very ornate church. The church in Kalinche is what would be called a straightforward barn and tower church. Big square, rect or a big rectangle with a, a tower built on the end of it. Uh, because they were, there were like two designs, so you could have one or two. Uh, and, uh, but this is a much more, believe it or not, a much more elaborate building that you have here. And that's for a particular uh, reason. Um, uh, the um, little history that's provided in the Order of Service mentions a document of 1306 when this place is mentioned. Um, and it's mentioned because it, 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 had a, it paid a fee farm to uh, the, the monks of the Order in uh, Cumber. Uh, but that document also mentions, and I usually tell people about this, whether they, they like history or not, uh, at these occasions, um, the, um, uh, the uh, money that that document of 1306 talks about uh, is a thing called the first fruit and tenth. Uh, and uh, that has a, a, um, a consequence for this place. First fruits and tenths were when a, a priest was collated to a parish, put into a parish in the Middle Ages, he had to pay his first year's stipend and a tenth of his stipend every year thereafter to the central church, which then was Rome. You would say the RCB now. Um, uh, and uh, um, at the time of uh, the Reformation, that was, that was stopped. And a huge sum of money had accumulated and a huge sum of interest had accumulated. And the Church of Ireland felt that uh, they should get that money back. Uh, and they thought they would get the money back. Uh, but that wasn't what the uh, public authorities had in mind. They kept the money. They kept the money in the Exchequer. And the interest on it was used for all sorts of, of things. Uh, until um, the uh, end of the, or the beginning of the 18th century, end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th century, the Church of Ireland decided that it wanted to make a big, the, the bishops of the Church of Ireland really wanted to make a big push to get that money back to build churches like this. Uh, so they identified a young clergyman from County Meath who uh, had very strong connections into the English administration in London. Uh, and they, his name was Jonathan Swift. Uh, and they sent Jonathan Swift over to London to renegotiate the return of the first fruits and tenths. And they sent with him, because he was quite a junior clergyman at that time, he was uh, a rector in County Meath, they sent with him the Bishop of Limerick in order to give him a bit of authority. But as soon as the Bishop of Limerick got to London, he cleared off. And there's no further mention of him whatsoever. He obviously had only gone to, to see Hamilton or something. Uh, and uh, Jonathan Swift was left, and he successfully negotiated the return of the first fruits and tenths to the, to the Church of Ireland, which was a tremendous feat of negotiation. Um, and he felt that he would, for certain, be made an English bishop because of the skill he had shown in statecraft in many ways in that financial negotiation. But of course he wasn't. And he wasn't even made an Irish bishop, dear love him. Uh, he had to settle for being the, the Dean of St. Patrick's for the rest of his life in Dublin. And that embittered him hugely uh, against the English administrations. That's why his writings are characterized by those very bitter uh, invectives against England. Um, but uh, in any case, that board of first fruits became the ecclesiastical commissioners. 
uh, after about 70 years. And the ecclesiastical commissioners gave this parish £900 uh, to uh, go towards the building of this church. But most important, and that would, have, that would have covered the building of a church like Kalinche. But most importantly, because of the special relationship that particularly uh, obtained east, in the east of the province here, uh, the Gardens of Florida Manor gave, uh, gave a sum of about £2,300 or maybe more, which was a sort of massive sum of money in those days, so that the church could be a little bit special in a sense, connected to their estate. Uh, and uh, um, so that was, that was the second way that it was possible to build a church. And the third way is the way that you have had to do over the past number of years, from your own pocket. There are no ecclesiastical commissioners anymore. And much and all, we love the RCB, and it gives out a little bit of money to churches. It doesn't give out much. So anything that's done in a parish is done by you. And it's a tribute over the years, that you've worked away and that you have made this place, which is very close to your hearts, have made this place what it is, a comfortable place to come to worship, a place where people feel welcome, a place that is well kept. And that can only be done by the goodwill of parishioners and their friends in these days. And that needs to be recognized on occasions like this. But the other reason, perhaps the reason why it is close to your heart, is because this is the place where you encounter the holiness of God. This is the place where you encounter the holiness of God. And many of you will no doubt have memories, warm memories of this place, of coming here on special occasions or of coming here when you were children. And perhaps only when you look back, do you realize how formative that was, of your character and of your faith like Jacob at Bethel. This place is the gate of heaven. Didn't realize it until he woke from the dream. This very often happens when we manage to shake ourselves out of the dream of life and consider what the realities are that we can't see and touch, but which are the most real things because they are eternal things. And that's the love of God, the love of his people, and the love of his word. Um, When you encounter the holiness of God, uh, it can sometimes be very comforting, it can be inspiring, but it will also be unsettling. Because an encounter with the living God is more likely than not to knock us off balance. It is not his will that we should be perpetually off balance. It's just that from time to time, He needs to make his presence known and felt. And his will is that we steady ourselves and we go out and do the things that he has called us to do, that he has given us a vocation to do. And not just a vocation in terms of church things, but a vocation in terms of our ordinary civic life, what we do in the places where we um, uh, work and live. And that happens to individuals. It also happens to parishes. Sometimes it happens to whole countries that's being knocked off balance. And I want to just talk a little bit about a couple of times when that happened. And I sometimes tell this story about going on holiday a few years ago to a church in, uh, or went on holiday and visited a church in Kent on a large estate in Kent. And I went in because the, the vestry door was open and the nosy. I went in to have a look and see what was in the vestry. And it was very plain, but there was a an etching up on the wall, and the etching was very clearly of that church, about the time of the 1820s. And there were no pews in the middle, it was a vast open space. The pews were bolted along the side walls, and sitting in them were a lot of very confused-looking village people, bored-looking village people. And in the pulpit was an old boar like myself, standing. And you could see he was even boring himself, a very long sermon. And in the middle, one chair, a huge chair in the middle of the nave, nothing else, was the very, very distinctive, unmistakable figure of the Duke of Wellington, asleep, fast asleep in his chair, because it was the, it was the uh, church on his estate uh, in, uh, in Kent. And then, in the 1820s and 1830s, there were a group of lay people, clergy people, who began to talk about the church in a different way. 
that it wasn't a department of state. The clergymen weren't just civil servants who were paid by the state. They began to talk about the church as God's eternal people, as an army mighty with banners, stretching back all the way to Abraham. They began to introduce things into church, robes that I'm wearing and that the rector's wearing. They wouldn't have worn those till then. They would have worn a simple clerk's gown. They began to introduce... They had an interior decoration principle, which was, we'll have another one of those. Garish. What they were determined to do was to make sure that when someone came through that door, they knew they were entering a different place. They knew that this wasn't just another hour when they were going to do another thing. They knew that they were going to encounter the holiness of the living God. They began to introduce all sorts of things. At the Reformation, most churches got rid of lots of things in worship, lots of physical things in worship. And the Church of Ireland has spent the last 400 years bringing them all back in again, slowly but surely. And there's a lovely line from one of our great theologians, Hooper, that the proper use of a thing, the improper use of a thing, does not take away the right use thereof. It can be badly used or it can be well used. So we've tried to reintroduce these things to make worship interesting to make it lively. Because in those 1820s, when those prisoners were sleeping around the walls, the one thing that they were certain about was that God didn't make much of a difference to anything. And that group of clergy in the 1830s and afterwards were determined that people would know that God made a difference. And the rector wouldn't agree with them. They were called the Oxford Movement. Uh, and they introduced all sorts of things into churches. However, at the time of the Reformation, although it was a completely different practice, the same principle applied, where the reformers felt that the clutter that had come into churches got in the way of God, got in the way of the world. So they got rid of them, simple whitewashed churches. But it was exactly the same principle that was being followed, that the people in church, in whatever way it was, I mean, this emphasis, obviously, on the Word and on Scripture at the Reformation. Different emphasis. A different emphasis, particularly with those people in the 1820s and 1830s when this church was being built. An emphasis on beauty. They were always talking about the beauty of holiness. And it's a thing which we don't very often talk about. We talk about the love of God and the grace of God, sometimes the wrath of God, the compassion of God, the generosity of God. But it isn't often that we talk about the beauty of God. And beauty has to do with all sorts of things, with tone and line and color and proportion. And it's uh, a very heartwarming thing that today we would also dedicate a work of art, a work of art that in some way reflects the beauty that lies at the heart of God, the beauty that he wants to connect, how he wants to connect with people. Because when you look at a beautiful thing, Somehow it gets to a part of you that words and other things don't get to. There's a response. It calls something out in you. It's latent. It's there. And that very often lies dormant. Because we, old Ulster prods, are a fairly reserved kind of a bunch. And we don't like to let ourselves go. It's a thing of beauty. Or in church. But each of those movements of the Holy Spirit, whether it's the Oxford movement, whether it was the Reformation, whether it's more modern church worship, is intended to make this place different. When this church was built, the landscape changed. People could see something that they couldn't see before. And that's what you and I are here for, to change the landscape in the parish of Kilmoud so that the glory of God can be seen in the land. Now you may be looking at the person beside you and saying, they don't look very glorious to me. You may be looking up here and saying, he doesn't either. But nevertheless, that's what we're here for. And the glory of God is seen, if you want to see it anywhere, it's seen in those Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. 
Blessed are the pure in heart. That means single-minded. For they will see God. And above all in this country of ours. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the sons and the daughters of God. That is they shall be like God. They shall be clearly of him. They shall be his sons and his daughters. And that's what we're called to do. So the people out there who look at this place will say to themselves, thank God it's there. Thank God it's been there for the past 200 years. And thank God for the people in it. Because they bring something to this place which no one else can bring. Bring a goodness. What the Bible calls holiness, which is a very much misunderstood word. There is a kind of holiness which is very often characteristic of Northern Ireland, which is cold, it was aloof, it was superior, it was undoubtedly good, but there was no love in it. And therefore there was no redeeming power, no redemptive power whatsoever. But the holiness you are called to is the holiness of Jesus Christ. It's an involved goodness. It's to follow him to the places where people find it, as he did, very difficult to be fully human. And to take those parts of ourselves which are not really fully human. And to turn them into the image of God and of the glory of God. That's the holiness that you encounter here, and it's the goodness that you're asked to go out and to embody. Not that other sort of goodness. Rowan Williams, when he was at Cambridge as an undergraduate, had a very good friend from Belfast, uh, and he said he was so good it made you want to kick him. It was as though he had passed the exam and you hadn't. That's not what holiness is. That's not what goodness is. Goodness changes the landscape. Goodness makes people feel there are things which they didn't think they could do, which they can do. With all his encounters, Jesus met people, was never able to do anything for anybody who said, I have it. He was only able to do things for those who said, I need. So we come here, and people have been coming here for 200 years, week by week, in order to encounter the holiness of God be filled by him and to be sent back out again just that little bit better equipped than we were when we came in and then to come back again because during the week we leak a bit we lose some of it and we come back to be to be filled again and as we look back over those years we can say with oh Jacob surely this indeed is the house of God and surely this is the gate of heaven and so now unto him by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus unto all generations forever and ever. Amen.
we remain standing as we proclaim our faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. O Lord, save the Queen. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. O Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O oh God, make clean our hearts within us. God, the strength of all those who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers. And because through the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do no good thing without you, grant us the help of your grace, that in the keeping of your commandments, we may please you both in will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we say together the second and the third colleagues together, go before us. Go before us, Lord, in all our doings with your most gracious favor and further us with your continual help that in all our works begun, continued and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name and finally by your mercy attain everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that your Holy Spirit may so guide and govern us that in all the cares and occupations of our daily life, we may never forget your presence, but may remember that we're always walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. First of all, Jean and I would like to thank your rector, Stanley, for the invitation to be here this morning. Uh, he's been working with me very hard, nearly for a year. Really, I uh, have to get this clerical color on occasionally just to sort of uh, take the cobwebs away. But as you've heard this morning, this is a morning about continuity. Um, it's very appropriate that Archbishop John is with us this morning and uh, represented us of what is now Florida Manor. Uh, Jean and I were there yesterday for the fun day. I uh, can't remember how many wee buns I ate. I ke people kept coming to speak to me and I kept eating another bun. Uh, so I definitely didn't eat any lunch after it. Uh, but about 1978, uh, the summer uh, when I arrived here, people talked about Florida Manor. So I decided I would find out where the building is, the house. And I can remember going up that long driveway, and the place was a wilderness, a wilderness in 1978. And those of us who have just appeared, like out of the ether, to see it as it is now, it's a wonder uh, that, that it has been restored, and, and the land around it, and all the outbuildings and so on, it's absolutely wonderful. And to boot, just for me to drive here this morning, and they see the courthouse in the order it's in outside, and the cottages, and of course, this building inside and out. 
Uh, it's appropriate. It's called St. Mary's, the link back to Cumber, and also uh, to Mood himself, the, the saint of Celtic times. So this little poem, which I wrote a little while ago, uh, which is uh, in front of you, it reminds us that, yes, Peter's continuity with his father and myself and Stanley, the clergy, but in fact, the building of this building was lay-led. It was driven. The name David Gordon is etched into this context here of this building and, and other buildings in this area. So... The poem is called Gloria. Re-establish David Gordon's wish. It happened. Parish of Kilmood. Mark was helped. Church needed. A lot happening at the same time. Far southwest, another famine. Organized police force underway. What of Christian presence now? Nendrum, Cumber, Long gone, how to spread Messiah's praise. Reformations and plantations, new spiritualities abound, established alongside reformed. At the manor, building projects, courthouse, school, sectors house, workers' cottages, and a church. Motto of the Gordons needed, by courage, not cunning. St. Mary's a reality gothic in style. Lots of new church buildings, length and breadth of the land, one rises on top of rocky ground. James Crawford Gordon, coming down from Cambridge, became its new vicar. Education, law and worship along a country road lay a foundation, 1 Corinthians 3 continued part of manor until Kalinchy Union, 1928. Kalinchy, Kilmood, and Tully the Kill. Vickers gave way to rectors. Now Dr. Stanley's the man. Scripture, reason, tradition. Gloria for two centuries. Bells ring out to Cato within. Box pews filled by new families. Kilmud or Kilmood, peopled. Manor house. Restored, St. Mary's, Kilmood, Dio Gratias. Now we move into our prayers of thanksgiving for this bicentenary. So let us give thanks to the Lord for his blessings to this parish over the last 200 years for the blessings brought to the people in this area through the ministry of this parish church of St. Mary's Kilmood. Let us bless the Lord for all who have ministered in this place, faithfully proclaiming your word and duly administering your sacraments. Let us bless the Lord for all who have worshipped in this place and served as brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us bless the Lord for all who have been baptized in this place and welcomed into the family of faith. Let us bless the Lord for all who have shared the good news of Christ's love to the children of the Sunday school. Let us bless the Lord for all who have been confirmed in this place and received the sacrament of Christ's most blessed body and blood. Let us bless the Lord. For all who have served and contributed to the life of the parish through the select vestry and various organizations. Let us bless the Lord. For all who have ministered to the sick, brought relief to the suffering and comforted the bereaved. Let us bless the Lord for all your faithful servants departed from this place, for the memory and example of all that was good and true in their lives. Let us bless the Lord. And so together, in darkness and in light, 
in trouble and in joy. Help us to trust your love, to serve your purpose, and to praise your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Raymond. Well, thank you to the Archbishop for his ministry to us here this morning. And after uh, the service, we will be uh, processing out of the church around to the north side of uh, St. Mary's for the unveiling and dedication of sculpture. And it's a delight to have uh, Mr. Alan Cargo and Dr. Eleanor Wheeler here, uh, the artists behind the sculpture. They're, they're hiding in the baptistry, but please do show them a token of our appreciation. the unveiling and dedication of the sculpture, you're all warmly invited for a bun fight over in the parish hall. And we just would have one cake, but two cakes to commemorate uh, the Bicentenary, so there's plenty to go around. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your support in the past and your own ongoing support in uh, the future. Uh, the Gospel is a living thing, it's a thing that is growing and dynamic, and as we go forward with the Gospel, we have every confidence that it will continue to bear fruit in this place. I inadvertently used the blessing as the inscription at the end of the sermon, so I will use the uh, Easter blessing. So may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.
Dear Lord, we thank you that you have put into the heart of your servant the will and desire to have these that's going today. And thank you for the skills and the hands of those who have made it, the minds of those who have conceived it. We pray that all of those who see it may be reminded of your steadfastness and your beauty. So we dedicate this sculpture in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.